Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we rip, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month on up as high as you want and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there and uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo, right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Hey there, Slashaholics. I've narrated a lot of slasher books here on the channel, but I wanted to tell my own story, my own fan fiction. A story I've thought of for a while called Friday the 13th Quarantine. I always wondered what would happen if we put a slasher story during the apocalypse. The end of the world happening all around, but a uh, slasher still does what a slasher does. So... I hope you enjoy my little story here. This story is not supposed to take place in the exact movie timeline with the films we know from Paramount and New Line. Um, look at this as kind of an Elseworld story, a different universe where this is happening, a universe that is really similar to the Friday the 13th universe we know, but might have some slight differences and things happen a little differently. So, here we go. You might recognize some familiar things from the film series, but keep in mind, this is a what-if, an Elseworlds type tale. Friday the 13th Quarantine by Josh LaRue. Prologue. <laughs> September 2003. After the killing spree by Jason Voorhees that stretched from Springwood, Ohio, all the way to Crystal Lake, New Jersey, authorities went to Camp Crystal Lake to investigate, under the impression the murderer, Jason Voorhees, was deceased. They were dead wrong. The first team of detectives and forensics experts were met with mass casualties. One uniformed patrolman did escape to tell the story, and a larger team was sent to the campgrounds to bring Jason back dead or alive. Again, they were unsuccessful and lost many more men and women. For a while, they left Jason alone, not wanting to lose any more officers, so they barricaded entrances to Crystal Lake and pretended everything would be okay if no one went to those damned campgrounds again. Although some officers were furious, and they wanted him to face justice, and they started making phone calls higher and higher up, the government already had a file on Jason Voorhees, and with this new report, they took a deeper look. <laughs> February 2004. The military was eventually dispatched, but was unable to locate Voorhees, even though several soldiers were killed on this mission. Because of the nature of these slayings and inability to capture and detain Jason Voorhees, secret government agencies stepped in with a plan. If they couldn't put Jason Voorhees in their prison for observation, then they would make his home his prison. 
They could have opted to just destroy the entire area, but Jason's ability to avoid death and to seemingly regenerate injuries intrigued secret government scientists, who saw this imprisonment plan as a way to also observe and study this freak of nature. In an inhuman exercise that took place over an accelerated 48-hour period, the secret agency installed a large, impenetrable, solid steel wall around the Crystal Lake campgrounds with electrified fencing and several watchtowers on the outside perimeter. For almost three years, Camp Crystal Lake was under 24-hour surveillance, and Jason was a prisoner in his own home. Until... <coughs> July 2006. General Jameson Allen Andrews oversaw the top-secret 245B Trioxin project. This secret military project was a means of perfecting 245 Trioxin. Its effects would reanimate corpses with an unending hunger for human brains. The idea originally was to use Trioxin in combat on the enemy, so the U.S. military could literally reanimate their fallen enemies, which would in turn begin attacking the living ones. The problem was, the original 245 trioxin was chaotic and didn't just reanimate corpses, but anyone within the radius of its airborne form would slowly die themselves and become the undead as well. This was counterproductive in close combat. So 245B trioxin was made to be a modified form that did not affect the living, that is, unless they were bitten or scratched or ingested the blood of a 245B reanimated corpse. A living subject who simply came into contact with 245B trioxin, airborne or otherwise, would not perish and reanimate. However, the new formula had other surprise results. It made the undead even more vicious and bloodthirsty than before. Now, instead of brains, the reanimated corpses would devour any living creature whole. It needed and demanded not just the brains, but also the organs, blood and flesh of animals and humans constantly to satiate its hunger. General Andrews had completed all field trials of 245B trioxin and was set to reveal his results to the top of the ladder. That is, until his son, Lieutenant Jesse Andrews, was taken as a hostage by a terrorist cell in Iran called Axis. General Jameson Andrews attempted to use his power and influence to get his son home safely, but the president and his cabinet refused to negotiate with the terrorist. General Allen begged and pleaded with the president to no avail. Shortly later, in September 2006, Axis released an execution video of Lieutenant Jesse Andrews, citing their demands not being met by the President of the United States. General Andrews slipped into a dark depression at the loss of his only son. He blamed the President and his cabinet. General Andrews smiled and shook the president's hand at his son's memorial, but his revenge was already in play. He would show the president death. <laughs> On September 13, 2006, General Andrews went rogue and launched five missiles at Washington, D.C., loaded with 245B trioxin. Only one missile hit its mark while the others were taken out in the upper atmosphere. No one other than General Andrews had knowledge that the missiles held 245B trioxin, and when they were destroyed, the trioxin spread into the atmosphere and would go on to be distributed across the entire continent and further. In rain, storm, snow, sleet, and ice, everything happened so fast. The missile that struck DC hit its desired target the United States Soldiers and Airmen's Home National Cemetery. The release of the 245B trioxin, coupled with a rainy fall day, caused a mist to rise and flow across the cemetery. The dead rose almost immediately, and chaos ensued. If D.C. had been the only place the dead were reanimating, then it may have been stopped. But the trioxin that spread across the atmosphere was already seeding into rain clouds across the continent and beyond. And within hours, the dead were rising in so many places and infecting so many of the living that the military never had a chance. General Andrews had gotten his revenge, and now the entire world would soon pay.
September 13th, 2006, Crystal Lake. Jason was aware that he was being watched. They'd been watching for a long time now, and they had built their walls to keep him in. He knew those walls wouldn't hold him, but he had no desire to leave. He didn't want them in his home. The ones who killed Mother. The ones who let him drown. They always showed up, came into his home, and he would kill them all. Mother said so. Kill for Mother. Kill them. Kill them all, she had said. He still heard her voice. He still had Mother's decayed head in his small shack where he stayed. He was glad they were leaving him and Mother alone. But if they tried again to take him away from Mother, he would kill them all again. Over two years had passed since they turned Camp Crystal Lake into Jason's prison. Over two years with no visitors, no groups of drunk stoners having sex like the counselors that were supposed to be watching Jason, or like the counselor that had lopped off Mother's head. And in those two and a half years of no outliers in his home to fight back and hurt him, Jason had almost fully regenerated to his original human form. His skin was almost normal. His scars were disappearing. He moved quicker than he had in a long time. Both his eyes could see again, and he felt stronger than ever. Jason was walking along the bank of Crystal Lake as the evening sun was suddenly covered by dark, heavy rain clouds. The rain fell hard and fast as if out of nowhere, and a strange mist began to rise off the lake and across the ground at Jason's feet and beyond into the trees. Jason cocked his head and peered through his battered hockey mask across the lake as he began to hear a gurgling sound, and he noticed several spots of the lake where water looked as if it was boiling and bubbling. As Jason watched, the mist began to dissipate, and then he saw a bony hand reaching from the depths in one of the bubbling spots upon the lake. He turned his attention to the other spots and saw more remains rising to the surface, decayed flesh hanging from bones. He had seen this happen before not too long ago, when the girl with the powers had hurt him like none other. As he attempted to kill her and her meddling boyfriend, a decaying corpse had risen from the depths and pulled him down and held him prisoner under the water until he was set free and awoken by a boat that led him away from his home to a place far away that he hated. He had found his way home that time, but he would not let it happen again. He would not be pulled under this time. As he watched the corpses begin to float and wade towards him on the shore, Jason removed the machete from his waistband. He stood on the bank of Crystal Lake holding the machete. He wore a faded blue work shirt, torn black pants, worn work boots, and of course the hockey mask that gave him comfort and hid his deformities. He was going to fight. He was going to kill. He was going to protect his home. As he watched the bodies moving in the lake towards him, he heard a snap behind him. He was not alone on the banks of Crystal Lake. He spun to see the corpses of three of his very own victims that were never found. He didn't understand how they were here. He had done what Mother had said. He had killed them all. But here they were, shambling towards him, their arms outstretched, teeth gnashing, and he was their target. The first of the three was a male who had camped out in Crystal Lake with two females, shortly after the police had given up on capturing Jason. Jason had found them in the throes of a drunken threesome in a tent, and he had drugged the male from the tent and hacked off one of his arms with his machete. And as the man tried to crawl away, Jason had twisted his head completely around. And now here he was, the man from the tent, with his one remaining arm reaching behind him towards Jason, his rotted head and empty eye sockets staring at Jason as he walked backwards towards the slasher. Jason swung his machete with purpose and lopped off the backwards head of the male, but the body kept coming. The head watched from the ground, its tongue wagging, its bottom jaw was now detached. It sounded like he was trying to speak. The body turned around and was now facing Jason, and its one hand grabbed Jason's shoulder. 
Jason acted fast, hacking off the remaining arm, then the legs. The remains were still twitching on the ground at Jason's feet. Jason was confused, but his instinct was to kill. He swiftly cut the head on the ground in half and turned his attention to the other two corpses coming out of the woods. It was the two girls from the threesome. He had reached into the tent that night and grabbed them both by the back of their heads and drugged them out of the tent as they slapped and scratched at him. Their death was swift. He simply slammed their heads together, shattering their skulls and turning their faces to mushy, bloody messes. And now, those smashed and also rotted faces stared at him through what used to be their eye sockets, but now was nothing more than sunken, decayed flesh over shattered faces. Their skeletal arms reached and grabbed at Jason, but before they could do any damage, he again grabbed them by the back of their heads and slammed what remained of skulls together again and again until there was nothing left. The bodies dropped to the ground twitching. Jason began hacking and hacking at the three corpses and limbs on the ground until they ceased to move. In the chaos, Jason had neglected the lake behind him, and if not for his supernatural keen senses, he may have been ambushed from behind. But he heard a splashing sound and spun around inhumanly fast and saw an almost completely skeletal body not six feet in front of him, walking from the water. Barely any flesh remained, but it was coming at him. And behind it, five more corpses in similar condition were making their way to the bank of the lake and to Jason. Jason didn't recognize the corpses, though he knew they had to have been victims he had dispatched in years past. But that wasn't important. He heard his mother's voice in his head. Jason, my special boy. They want to hurt you, Jason, like they hurt me. Don't let them, Jason. Don't let them hurt you. The confusion of how the corpses were returning and his mother's words sent an inhuman rage surging through his body and his machete moved fast, and within seconds he had struck down all the corpses that had risen from his lake. Jason stared out on the water and saw the lake was calm again. He turned back around and at his feet, noticing some limbs still twitching, he crushed them until there was nothing left to move. Jason was confused and furious. He needed to see Mother. He made his way into the woods of Crystal Lake and headed straight for his ramshackle home in the deepest part of the woods surrounding Crystal Lake. The police and military had never found it, but that was because Jason never let them. Anyone who even came close to finding it wouldn't live to see the shack, or if they did, they wouldn't live to tell others. Jason entered his shack and heard a strange snapping noise coming from the back room, Mother's Room. Jason charged into the back room of the shack and saw his mother's head, but it wasn't just sitting there anymore. Its mouth was moving, and its eyes opened and saw him standing before it. Jason blinked from behind his hockey mask. Mother was awake. J Jason, the head of his mother rasped. Jason knelt before Pamela Voorhees' head and watched intently. Jason... My special boy, is that you? It asked. Jason did not answer. He only watched. Mother is hungry, Jason. You must feed me, Jason. Feed me, Jason, and we will never be apart again. Jason didn't even wonder how a head alone could eat, but he knew he never wanted to lose Mother again. Mother had come back to him. He didn't care how or why. He only knew one thing. He would feed Mother. He took two bear traps off the wall in the front room of his shack that were hanging next to a special trophy of his. 
tattered red and green fabric wrapped around a glove affixed with four rusted razor-sharp blades. He didn't give another thought to the corpses that came back from the dead. He had no idea that the world outside his prison was ending, and that soon there would be no more people watching him from their towers. No, Jason had one mission, feed mother. So he set out to hunt, and hunt he did. He would hunt and kill any animal that remained in his prison of a home at Camp Crystal Lake, and he would feed and be with his mother. And so he did, for a time. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been the prologue of my short story, novella. I don't know what it's, how long it's going to be yet. It's still a work in progress. I'll release new chapters as I write them. Friday the 13th Quarantine. I've had a lot of fun thinking up this story and making the outline for it in my head and on paper, coming up with the characters that you're about to meet. Um, there's going to be a group of survivors that are going to find their way out from... Uh, the apocalypse outside Jason's walls and into Camp Crystal Lake. Uh, they're going to go there for security and safety, but I don't think that's what they're going to find. Um, and I can't wait to take you all along for the journey as this story unfolds. Um, I think you're going to uh, really like a couple of the characters that you're going to meet in Chapter 1. And uh, the way the events are going to play out in this story... I think it's going to keep you uh, interested and on the edge of your seats waiting for the next chapter. It's going to be a crazy, wild ride, and uh, I really hope you enjoy it. I knew where I wanted my story to be. I wanted it to be uh, during a zombie apocalypse. Uh, Jason has become a prison in his own campground uh, because the you know police, government, military, everything has given up on trying to capture him. And instead, they decided you know to imprison him there to keep people out, keep him in, and keep him under observation. Uh, but then the world ended, you know. Um, I really wanted to get to the story, but I had to set up, you know, how it all went down. And Trioxin just sounded like so much fun to throw into this story. But the regular Trioxin might have been a little too silly, you know, brains and everything. Uh, so I went with the modified, uh, modified version of Trioxin, uh, you know, a general who had been deeply hurt and uh, lost something very important to him inadvertently caused the end of the world. Uh, he was only wanting to take out D.C. Uh, I don't think he expected it to take out the entire world, but that's where we're going to be. Uh, when we get to Chapter 1, it's going to be about a year after uh, where we left off with Jason going out to find animals to feed Mother. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun to see how this plays out. Um, I hope you all enjoyed Jason having to fight against uh, some of his past victims. Uh, I really had fun envisioning uh, a zombie with its head twisted backwards, so it's kind of shambling backwards, reaching, reaching its arm behind itself, uh, because if it walked straight ahead, it wouldn't be able to see Jason. And I thought it was cool that Jason got to kill the two girls the same way that he had killed them in life. He killed their corpses the same way. Um, I had fun making references to the other movies like Freddy vs. Jason, uh, Friday the 13th, The New Blood, talking about Tina's dad coming out of the water. And, uh, you know, I really wanted to play with the idea that Pamela's back. You know, she might be a severed head that's reanimated and maybe even just using Jason to bring her food. But, he's got Mother back, and, you know, to Jason, I can see that how that would be very important to him, and might even calm him a little bit, you know. 
So it's going to be interesting to see how that dynamic plays out. Um, that, like I said, this is a work in progress. I'm still writing it. Uh, so it's I don't exactly know exactly every bit of the story where it's going to go. I have an idea of where I want to get to. Uh, but uh, it's all still in play until we get there. So I'm excited to see where this story goes as well. You know, What would happen if Jason lost his mother again? What kind of rage would that be? Well, we're going to find out. Thank you all so much for listening. Please let me know if you enjoyed this prologue, if you're excited about this uh, fan story that I'm writing. I was like, hey, I've narrated 70 slasher books. I want to write one, even if it's a short one. Um, Thank you all so much again. Be excellent to each other. And remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. I'll see you soon.